It is Tuesday, March 19, 2024, the first day of spring. I'm Crash Connell. Mary Danielson is here. And if I'm seeing the calendar correctly, last time we had this guest on was back in November, mm-hmm. late November. Yeah. It's been a while, so let's. it's going to be a good day to catch up. Yeah. In Jesus' name, may, may everything work. Yes, yes. I'll amen that. And we do have uh, John Heller back with us today, and we're looking forward to what he is observing in our world and it is so hard to keep up. And every time I say that, I think it can't get any worse, but then I'm wrong. So uh, I got a scripture this morning, and we're going to pray, and I'll introduce John, and we'll hit the ground running once again. Isaiah 33, 6. Wisdom and knowledge will be the stability of your times and the strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. Oh, would you pray with me this morning? Oh, Heavenly Father, you are righteous in all your ways and near to those who call upon you. Oh, we come with nothing of our own today and desire more of you every hour. We need you so badly, Lord. Help us to be mindful of all you do for us. We thank you uh, for your provisions, both spiritually and physically. Lord, we lift up those in our lives who don't know you, and we ask for open doors for family, neighbors, and friends to hear about you. Help us to be sensitive to your leading. We lift up John to you and his loved ones. Thank you that you protected them in the recent severe weather bout. And we pray for continued strength and energy for him to fulfill the calling that you have given him. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor, lawyer, teacher, known for his weekly prophecy updates, a trial lawyer for almost 40 years. John serves as an elder at Fellowship Bible Chapel. His prophecy updates are available on Fellowship Bible Chapel YouTube channel, FBC. John, good morning. Welcome back to Stand Up for the Truth. Good morning, Mary. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty well. Well, tell us about the storm damage that you had over there. You were in the middle of that. How you're doing, and how we can pray yeah, for it was, you. It was it was weird. We're fine. Uh, we we have well, we had like one to two inch hail, and so we have mm. a cover on patio furniture on our back deck, and uh, that was shredded by the <laughs> hailstorm, but. The, the storm, there was a F3 tornado that hit about 40 miles to the west. It was coming our way. It destroyed a little town called Lakeview, up at a place called Indian Lake, mm. and uh, outside of Bell Fountain. And it, um, I mean, it just destroyed the town. It destroyed a mobile home park and that type of thing. And it was coming right at us. And we're watching the TV downstairs on our lower level, of course. But it's like, you don't really want to be here right now. And they're like drawing these little lines on the on the TV screen with the <laughs> Telestrator. And it's like our lot that they're driving, wow. riding over. But about two miles west of us, the storm turned a little bit to the south. And you always wonder like, well, should I pray that the storm misses me? Because then it's going to hit somebody else oh. that lives in your neighborhood. But it did. It tore down two of those, you know, those giant electrical transmission towers about just across the lake from where we live about two miles away. I mean, it just shredded two of them. Mm. Uh, there's a golf course. So it went about a half mile to a mile South of us. It was an F1 tornado when it went through here and there's a golf pretty exclusive golf club, not one that I would ever belong to sort of the Groucho Marx thing. I don't want to belong to any club that would have me <laughs> as a member uh, statement that he made years ago, but mm-hmm. Uh, probably the most exclusive golf club in the Columbus area, and they lost a thousand trees wow. in the storm. And I mean, you go through the neighborhoods down there along the road that we sometimes drive over to church, and it's just—I mean, it's—it's it's not complete devastation. I mean, they're pretty big houses, so there's. Um, Roofs ripped off, siding ripped off. You know, and I would guess between a couple neighborhoods that we drove through, there's probably. 15 or 20 homes that people probably aren't going to be living in for a while mm. and ripped off some roofs at the school and everything. So we, mm. we really dodged the bullet here. I think there were six people killed up in Lakeview up mm. by Bell Fountain, but uh, you know, so we, we made it through. Um, it's kind of interesting because I know we want to talk about the eclipse on April the 8th that's mm-hmm. coming mm-hmm. and we do live this whole area is in the path of totality of mm-hmm. that eclipse on April 8th. And I've seen a lot of, uh, so I'll just make my comment is, first of all, I think the fact that an eclipse happens at all is an extreme miracle and an indication that God created the universe. Because you, you, you cannot 
the 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 circumstances about how the moon, which is close to us and relatively small, can block out this perfectly block out the sun, mm -hmm. except for the corona of the sun, <coughs> at all ever means that you know the 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 I think the sun is four hundred times the diameter of the of the moon, and it's um, four hundred times further away from the Earth than the moon is, and so because of that absolute perfection, the moon can block out the sun. So to me, that's, that's sort of the big story is how does this happen? This does not happen by accident. Mm -hmm. God did this on purpose. So I don't know that this eclipse will mean anything. There was one back in 2017. There was another one that went across Texas and some other places in the Southwest uh, last year and people are making, I mean, there's videos all over the place that yeah. this is a sign and, you know, this is a sign that America needs to repent. Mm -hmm. But I think you, from what you talk about with your mm -hmm. guest and me, America need, already knew that it needed to repent. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's kind of low hanging discernment fruit in my opinion. Yeah. So I, you know, maybe we'll know something afterwards. I think a lot of times with these Bible prophecies, we know the prophecy is there, but exactly how they mm -hmm. play out is is unknown. So until mm -hmm. then, we're sort of engaged in what I would call righteous speculation <laughs> about a lot yeah. of it. So it, yeah. I've noticed. I, that I just don't think I, I'm not sure. I'm not convinced that it's it's you know I, I wouldn't plant my flag and said this is something you need to pay attention to. Right. What America needs to pay attention to is the Word of God. Right. Right. Um, that's but everybody is going, I mean, the, the stuff that's flying through my Twitter feed and mm -hmm. the Royal family and mm -hmm. people saying that King Charles has died. But then I just got a, a tweet that said he was seen going over to the hospital this morning. So he's not dead. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they'll say, well, it's a double, you know, it's, yeah. it's crazy right. what's right. going on. And everybody is sort of losing their minds. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I found when I look at uh, similar to the blood moons of 2015, a lot of it is the Hebrew roots movement because they're trying to attach a Jewish feast day with these signs. And so they'll say, well, if it's on Passover or if it's on Tabernacles, um, but one, and one such teacher of that movement says the eclipse is going to trigger Gog and Magog. They're so sure of themselves. And, and so it's something that we want to just warn listeners to, to, don't hang, uh, don't hang anything on that on that tree, uh, or don't hang your hat on anything related to this uh, for science. Yeah, we'll we'll know afterwards. I look and and I think that the one thing that I talk about when I talk to sort of look at what's going on in the world because I do think we live at a very. I think we're in the end times. I mean, I don't yeah. think there's any yep. question yep. about that. Mm -hmm. But I think that we need to be careful. So I sort of have that grid that I use: acceleration. Things are going to happen very quickly convergence a lot of things that are talked about in bible prophecy are going to be happening and being set up but there's also a logistics thing mm -hmm. so when i see um for example i i, I get emails every day that, that israel made some attacks last night on the on some warehouses in damascus where iran stores weapons or has transported weapons that would be used in any attack against israel and that was in a suburb of Damascus. And so immediately I get these emails from people like, well, is this, is this Isaiah 17 one? Is this the destruction mm -hmm. of Damascus? And my comment is, well, I don't think so because Damascus is still standing in the way the prophecy reads that it, it won't be a city after that, that destruction happens. Mm -hmm. Same way with, um, I get stuff all the time that Gog and Magog is ready to happen tomorrow uh, or today. And I'm like, there's a logistics part, you know? And so when you, when you look at the war, for example, if Russia is part of this invasion of Israel in the end times, and I can, I go both ways on it. I, I kind of think it is, but if, if when it comes, it, it, it has to come with an army, a great company and a mighty army is what Ezekiel chapter 38 says, 38 and 39. Well, I don't see that there. I mean, Russia has a couple thousand Wagner forces in Syria. That, to me, doesn't meet the criteria of a great company, a mighty army. And Russia's had some problems in Ukraine. They haven't done as well as everybody said. 
uh, that they thought, you know, they were going to be in Kiev in three days, and it's now been over two years, and it's not over. Um, but, you know, Israel, northern Israel, is a thousand miles from Ukraine. So if they're having mm-hmm. trouble with getting into the country next door, there has to be something change. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I don't know. I, I do think uh, on Ezekiel 38, 39, there's a, a very, I think verse nine says that you'll come up like a cloud mm-hmm. against Israel on the last days. And there was a very important article, I think, the other day in the Wall Street Journal that talked about that drone warfare mm-hmm. is changing everything. And these drones are being operated by AI. They're uh it's, it's impossible to control them individually. You know, about uh, in 2018, Israel celebrated its 70th anniversary. And one of the things they did in that celebration, they, I think it was out on Mount Herzl, and they had drones form in the sky. They, uh, they formed 70, you know, with blue lights, and then they reconfigured and they turned into a Star of David mm. or vice versa. I can't remember which one they did first. But when I saw that, and then a couple of years ago in um, Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates celebration, they had drones in the sky and they formed, one, one thing they formed was a giant computer style head that said AI, and it had AI in red in the middle of it. Then they formed what was a very realistic picture of the leader of the United Arab Emirates. And so my my take on that was if they can do that to wow us with the configuration mm-hmm. what are they planning to do with regard to the military application of drone swarms right. so the wall street journal article was very interesting very informative and they talked about the fact that um you know drones now you may be able to get them. Let's say they cost two thousand twenty five hundred dollars for a drone. You can put a hand grenade or an RPG on them, mm-hmm. and you can drop them onto a tank. But you know our military will come out and say, "Well, we used a a Patriot missile uh, to shoot them down." Well, Patriot missile costs I don't know two million or four million dollars. So yeah, they shoot them down, but the the cost benefit analysis really means you're kind of losing if they're if you're using a four, two million or four million dollar missile that you don't have that many of to shoot down right. a twenty five hundred dollar drone, that's not a good thing militarily. So, in with the development of AI and everything, this is this is going to be a big problem. So the concern is, we have these big aircraft carriers. They're they cost. I think the Gerald Ford, which just has gone into service, costs thirteen billion dollars mm-hmm. to right. build. And the concern is, well, with drone swarm or with a hypersonic missile that might cost a million dollars, one of those missiles hitting the right place can take out the whole aircraft carrier. So there's so a $13 billion ship becomes scrap with not much cost. Mm-hmm. So this is changing the whole concept of warfare. The Houthis in Yemen... Yemen is one of the poorest countries on the planet. They get some missiles from Iran. They may be developing some on their own. And they're effectively interrupting shipping in one of the most major shipping routes in the world. I think 40, no, I think it's 20% of all oil and gas goes through the Suez Canal. So company countries are shipping companies are just avoiding the Red Sea and the Suez Canal. That's causing economic pressure. I mean, and, and, and it's like this cascading effect. So Egypt is in economic turmoil right now uh, because the, a lot of their government revenue comes from the Suez Canal. That's been cut by 40% at least, <clears throat> maybe a little bit more. So the the question is, you know, Everything is very disrupted in the world. So shipping lanes right. and supply chains, which we had trouble with during the Charlie Vector thing a few years ago for a few years, they're back now just because this one group in a very poor country has drones and some missiles and they're able to shut down shipping. 
Right, right. Uh, John, I want to reference the name of this article from the Wall Street Journal. Drone swarms are about to change the balance of military power. It's very interesting because you mentioned that Gerald R. Ford a carrier of thirteen billion. It says for that same sum, a nation could purchase six hundred and fifty thousand drones. So this is changing uh, militaries all over the world. That's a lot of drones, John. Right. Well, and the U.S. military came out, and I can't remember what it's called. Uh, I think Rabbit is Project Rabbit or something. Mm. Is, Rabbit is in the name. And so what other countries are doing. And I just saw a video overnight uh, with Jason Wang, who's the CEO of NVIDIA, which is the big AI chip manufacturing thing, in a, in a huge crowd. It, it's, it's an, I, first of all, I don't even understand the language that they're talking. <laughs> it's sort of like, you know, we can argue about rapture timing and all that thing, but I'm now left behind in terms of <laughs> some of the development of this AI stuff. Yeah. But they're taking that technology using it in robotics to make rapid manufacturer ra rapid manufacturing of these drones a thing so in and the cost that it can be done for is relatively small so in ukraine which is you know look they're getting they're just getting uh the snot beat out of them by russia in terms of attack tax and missiles and drones and that type of thing tanks and losing you know, they've certainly lost into the six figures of people um there but ukraine has been able to do fight back by using technology and drones and manufacturing them in basement factories mm. in ukraine because that's where they're protected so i, I had a, a lawsuit many years ago involving counterfeit counterfeit uh the shoes, you know, like uh, Nike and LA gear and that type of thing that was being sold by a company. And what we found out was they're, they're all manufactured in these, these basement factories in Korea. You know, they, they, I mean, you have a storefront mm -hmm. and there'll be a cleaner and a restaurant and a shoe factory. <laughs> and some of them are authorized and some of them are not, but mm -hmm. so they're, they're sort of taking those concepts of, cheap labor and that type of thing. And the technology now allows that's this stuff to be manufactured in a very small area, very quickly. And people can change and adapt very quickly, especially with the software and mm -hmm. that type of thing. So Russia has been jamming things, but now Ukraine will come back and they'll have drones that can't be jammed for a while. Then Russia will jam them for a while. Then, you know, it's, it's a back mm -hmm. and forth, mm -hmm. but the speed that it happens at is what's important. So this is a, I think an end times thing that we talk about, it happens, it accelerates very quickly. Yeah, yeah. And I think we're at that stage. Well, so, the, is, as the article says, warfare is changing. It is changing. And one of the lines in here really struck me. The Department of Defense is already researching a brain-computer interface, which is a direct communications pathway between the brain and AI. John, what could possibly go wrong there? <laughs> well, you know, we already know that they have Neuralink. right. So, and I don't know, I've talked to a lot of different people on shows like this. So if I've talked about this before, just tell me and I'll, I'll be quiet. But a year ago, I was in Israel for the Christian Media Summit. The Israeli government brought some of us over there for that. And of course, this is a year, almost a year before what, I mean, nobody was talking about Hamas doing what they were doing. That, that just was not on the radar. We went yeah. down to a kibbutz right along the border, the kibbutz that's closest to the Gaza border. It was a very peaceful, pastoral, agricultural place, wonderful place. People loved it. They said it's like living in heaven, except for when they're firing rockets, then we have 10 seconds to get to a safe room. Mm -hmm. Nobody was thinking about a land invasion from across that fence. Um, and, and so things change very quickly. But in that, in that seminar, we had a business guy, and he was talking about the United, uh, the uh, Abraham Accords and how that was leading to all of this. And he goes, and now we have AI. We have this thing that just came out last week. Have you seen this called ChatGPT? And I had not heard of it at that point. It, it had not even been out a week. And I already had over a million downloads. Mm -hmm. And he said, this AI stuff is going to be amazing. You should invest in it. Uh, and then he said this. I, so I'm sitting in Jerusalem in a hotel conference room. And he says, and we will make the lame 
walk. Now, when he said that, immediately I thought of the passage where the disciples of John the Baptist come to Jesus and they say, okay, Jesus, John sent us here. We want to know, are you the one? Are you the Moshiach? Are you the, are you the Messiah? Or should we look for another? And what Jesus said back to them was, we will make, or, uh, you go back and tell John what you have seen. You have seen the lame walk, the blind see, and the deaf hear. And so I sort of, I mean, I think this is sort of where my law training comes in, where you sort of piece <laughs> bits of evidence mm -hmm. together. So I heard Jonathan Medved say that in the conference room, the lame will walk. I immediately thought, back to what the Neuralink rollout had been just a couple of weeks before and the organization of that rollout, the things they said, this is what Neuralink will, the, you know, the brain chip, which is now they've actually implanted it in people. And we want people to be able to walk. We want people to see and hear it. But it was the, the messianic signs that Jesus referred to, Neuralink was doing the exact same thing in their presentation we will make the lame in the wow. same order wow. the lame wow. walk the blind see and the deaf hear interesting and so there so when we we think of this ai stuff in the the way it's become so intrusive and infused into every aspect of our life and i will be honest with you i talk to people i can't identify or anything like that they they contact me that work in this industry and they said what you are seeing is not what's really going on hmm. <laughs> it's way beyond hmm. what you're seeing so last week joe rogan had an interview with uh, uh ray kurzweil kurzweil works for google he's been one of the big proponents of a thing called the singularity which has a very i think kind of dark anti-Christian spirituality, religious part to it, where they, they're going to merge man and machine. And if you remember 10 years ago, Kurzweil uh, was sort of the subject of an article in Time Magazine. It was, I think it was 2011. And the picture was a, the back of somebody's head with a cable coming out of it, kind of crude mm -hmm. in today's yeah, terms. I remember that. And it said 2045, the year man becomes immortal. So in this interview with Rogan, Kurzweil said, listen, um, by 2029, AI will be smarter. And it's always interesting. They use intelligence or smart. They never use wisdom. So yeah. wisdom doesn't seem yeah. to be in any of their equations. Yeah. No. But AI by 2029 will be smarter than any individual human, the smartest individual human. Mm. And the way it's developed, but then Elon Musk, who knows a lot about it. I mean, he's involved in this, this company. He's, he's the richest or close to the richest guy on the planet. He says, no, AI will be smarter than the smartest human by next year. By 2029, it will be smarter than all human intelligence combined. Wow. And so, so the question is, so I... Uh, Scott Townsend uh, sent me this video last night. I did a AI thing with Scott Townsend and Tom Hughes and Bridgelette a few weeks ago, and it's gotten a lot of views. I mean, it, it and it was long. I mean, it was a couple hours long. But Scott sent me this thing of Jason Wang speaking at a conference just in the last day or two about what NVIDIA is doing. And I'm telling you, Last week, the EU put in rules, regulations, a statute to, you know, we're going to regulate AI. That is a total, complete fantasy mm. that AI is going to be regulated. Mm. It's not going to be regulated. It's too pervasive. It's too everywhere. And uh, to be honest with you, you get some one or two bad actors. I mean, do you think China's going to pay attention to what the EU yeah, says? Right. Do you think Russia's going to pay attention to what the EU says? Yeah. And the tech companies have grown so big and so powerful that I I don't know. It, it, listen, I'm I'm ready for the Lord to come back <laughs> yeah. because I don't yeah. like where this is going. Yeah. yeah. 
I don't either. It's uh, it's incredible. Yeah, no, there there won't be any regulation, and and for the very reason that you say is that people are going to ignore it anyway. I mean, I don't know how the EU would think that they could somehow have a global standard there that people will follow, but that's not even a possibility. John, we only have a couple minutes left. Well, we got four minutes left in this particular segment. It went so fast. Um, the next uh, segment I want to talk about is this article. Uh, Net Zero, the Digital Panopticon, and the Future of Food, because so many things are converging at once. So many transitions, the Great Reset, all of that is coming, if it's not already here. Um, and then I want to talk about Israel in the second half, but um, sure. let's just define Panopticon. Like I said, it's Net Zero, the Digital Panopticon, and the Future of Food. Can we define a Panopticon before we jump in sure. in the second half? Yeah, this kind of goes into my, I have a master's degree in correctional criminology slash correctional administration. And one of the things we studied in our correctional administration thing was, you know, how do you control prisoners? And I actually worked at a federal prison while I was in graduate school, the federal prison in Terre Haute, Indiana. Um, and, you know, you you kind of get aware of the control points and the checkpoints. And, and you hope when you go in there to work with the guys that, uh, they let you back out at the end of the day because yeah. you have to go through one of those, the door, you know, the thing opens, you walk into the control point and then it shuts. But the Panopticon <coughs> was a thing that was devised back in the 19th century. Uh, Jeremy Bentham, I think is his name in uh, the UK. <coughs> and essentially it was a circular cell block. And in the middle of the cell block, there was a tower where the guards would sit. And so they would have, this you know six stories of cells so a lot of cells and the guards would sit there and because of the way the screening and everything worked was the prisoners could never tell when they were being watched the guards in the tower could turn around and see into every cell at any time 24 hours a day seven days a week but they couldn't see into every cell all the time but the impression was listen you're you're being watched and you just don't know when you're being watched so you better behave so it was a <laughs> very effective way of social control and it was very psychologically oppressive you know there, no privacy or anything like that now we live a lot of people have taken that concept this article on off guardian i think it was also a global research net zero the digital pan opticon is this is where we are is this the way our data is gathered mm. they're watching us all the time so yeah. you know i've been talking at conferences for a few years four or five years now about how data is being used the social credit system uh that's coming in place that's been implemented in china in places and i, I saw a video a recent video where a guy was sort of testing it out in china i think he was visiting but he jaywalked <laughs> And he took a video of him jaywalking and immediately his phone popped up. You know, you've been deducted points from your social credit account, wow. that type of thing. When they had protests about banking and that China's having a tremendous financial problems right now, banking wow. problems. Wow. The, the uh, people were going to protest in a certain city. And this was when they had the health pass. Remember, the health pass yeah. was on your phone. It had to be green. Oh, right, right. And they got to the city where they were going to engage in this protest. They haven't told, you know, they may have communicated that they're going to this protest. They're walking through the train station, and you have to show the green pass to exit the train station. Yeah, John, we've got to interrupt. Hold that thought because I want to, uh, that's a great teaser for this next article. But we have to take a break, and we will be back in two minutes with more from John Haller. Uh, the article is Net Zero, the Digital Panopticon, and the Future of Food. Uh, so many transitions going on in the world right now. So stay with me for the second half with John Haller. We're also going to talk about Israel. We will be right back. Feedback, questions, and topic suggestions are always appreciated. Email us at comments at standupforthetruth.com. Talk to us about that, John, the, how the lockdowns and all of that uh, provided it provided such a convenient way to bring us all into this particular I don't know um, dystopian disreality it, it, whatever this is. So sure, it's it's a convergence of a lot of different mm -hmm. threads. Um, so you know, with the COVID, uh, the Charlie Vec what I call Charlie Vector O One Nine or just so I can get past <laughs> the YouTube censors. Yeah, with Charlie Vector O One Nine, or of course 
<clears throat> there became a, a real desire on the part of the government to control what was said about that and the what I refer to as the state approved treatment for Charlie Vector 019. And it was very controversial. It was rolled out very, very quickly. And, you know, you know, I had friends die from both things, okay, from Charlie Vector and from the state approved treatment. And there's no doubt about this. So the question is, what do we do? So they they wanted to control everything. So they there became a partnership. It had really been in place before this. It started back around 2015, 2016 with that election. There were some people running for uh, president that some, uh, particularly one person that a lot of people did not like. And there became, you know, and, and there became these narratives that were created. So one of the narratives came out of the World Economic Forum called the Great Reset. And so when people like me talk about the Great Reset, and I cite what the World Economic Forum has said about wanting to change everything, you're immediately labeled with a conspiracy theory tag and your your social media accounts are, are blocked or your the spread of what you've said is really limited. This is a social control thing. And so the, the tech companies and the government, the United States government, have worked very closely to control what's said on various issues. I will be honest with you. I have no doubt in my mind about the narrative that's been created about the protest. So yesterday, mm. by the way, in the Supreme Court of the United States, we have a thing in the United States called the First Amendment. It says Congress shall make no law You know, regarding, we'll have freedom of speech and we have freedom of religion. And there was an argument yesterday about there's a case brought by Missouri and a bunch of other attorney generals about the this partnership that's arisen. And there's no doubt that it exists between the government and the tech companies. And the government says, hey, mm -hmm. we can't regulate this stuff directly, but you. Oh, oh I think we lost you. He's talking about this um, uh, this article the digital panopticon and it, the Greek, the great reset envisages a transformation of Western societies. Right. Oh, oh you're there. Okay. Cause we lost you for a oh, second. I, okay. Yeah. So, so in the Supreme court yesterday, they had this case about this, this partnership between government and the tech companies to restrict speech. That oh. appears like on its face to be a very easy determination that this violates yeah. the First Amendment. But yeah. there was this new Justice Jackson, Kenji Brown Jackson, who I would only describe as a diversity hire for mm. the Supreme Court. Mm. She was the one who, remember, in her confirmation hearing, she couldn't really give you the definition of a woman. Oh, OK. Yeah, that's her. OK. All right. But she's saying things like, well, you know, I'm concerned that your view of the First Amendment will hamstring the government in controlling speech that the government doesn't think is right. Wow. Well, that seems to be, do you understand, and Alito is there wow. saying, I, I don't think that this is the right, the way to, they should be able to go about this. And then the other justice on the other side of the political ledger She's going, well, this hamstrings the government. Well, that's the whole purpose of the First Amendment, Justice Jackson. <laughs> wow. And, and so then you tie that into the Great Reset, the control sure. of information, the flow of information, and now what's mm. going on with this digital panopticon and net zero and the, uh, the one of the articles they refer to or a publication is the financialization of nature where they are taking like natural assets and they're tokenizing them digitally to put them into this digital system where everything will be controlled. And the, the term in the digital panopticon article is that it's a shift of authoritarianism. And this is an authoritarian great reset that we're seeing and you're seeing it play out with digital currencies and that type of thing. And one of the things they talk about is net zero. King Charles just released a publication the other day from his organization that he created a few years back called uh, Terra Carta. Now, that should, mm -hmm. if you're familiar with English history, yeah. I went to the British Museum when I was in London a few years back. And one of the things I saw was one of the original copies of the Magna Carta from the 1200s under King, uh, 
King John to give that really sort of laid the foundation for Western civilization, freedoms and the U.S. Constitution and that type of thing. King Charles has taken that and he's made it into this Gaia Mother Earth worship yeah. thing that yeah. he calls Terra Carta and they want to control everything. And it's insane, Mary. Mm -hmm. You know this. They're, they're, they're getting rid of these uh, coal-fired plants, even nuclear plants. Well, we're going to just have a sun and solar or wind and solar that's going to do this. Well, those only operate maybe five hours a day. If you store what they give in batteries, you might get another two hours a day. But what we see here and locally and all over the country and all over the world is these giant data centers that are being created to store our data, stuff about us that run 24 seven. We have them here. The metadata farm 20 minutes from my house has six buildings. Each building is the, it's essentially the empire state building laid on its side in the field. Wow. It, they're almost a quarter mile long, six buildings. And they're just full of computers and servers and data racks and cables and that type of thing. And they have little scooters to go back. Across the road is Google has spent like $6 billion constructing a data farm, the server farm. And I would say half of it is backup power systems and mm. transformers and everything to make sure it runs 24-7. And so the question is, what's happening to us is they're tearing down coal burning fire plants yeah. in Ohio that used to, and they're not replacing them. And so there's this fantasy of net zero. So we're going to make electric vehicles. We're going to do all this. We're going to have all this data and mm -hmm. everything. And I guess it's just going to run on, you know, we just had uh, March 17th. So I guess leprechauns are yeah, going to run. Yeah, you unicorns know, and a, fairy dust. Yeah. There's a, a pot of electricity at the end of the rainbow, <laughs> I guess. There's no way there's enough electricity it, to run all those data farms. And, and, no, uh, it, it's a, it's a fantasy, but it's yeah. very control. And it goes, sure. it's, it's, so we have, we're in the midst of this industrial revolution and it requires a lot of electricity. And where is it going to come from? And what's going to be the impact with us? With, human beings need electricity yeah. and you have countries that don't have a lot of electricity yet like africa and other places and they want electricity too china's building opening like two coal burning fire uh two coal fired bur uh, power plants a week that's and, amazing and, and we're the problem so, and now they have all this stuff. And so that there's net zero agenda that this article talks about. And part of this where they can control this is food. So there's this, mm -hmm. you know, we got to get rid of meat and that type of thing because it takes too much. And so I had an article on Sunday in my update about Welsh farmers. Welsh farmers are being required now in Wales, in the UK, to give 20% of their land and, and assets back to green protected things mm. well mm. what what happens to the uh i think the best sign i saw was a welsh farmer holding a sign at a press saying we will not be moved M -O 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 <laughs> yeah, i saw that yeah yeah so i i don't know there it seems to be that um and and, and yuval harari talks about uh these things i just saw an interview with him Last week, he's got a new book out for children, by the way, on the a development of AI. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like, what are we going to do when all these human beings with all these robotics that Jason Wang was talking about this week at the AI convention? It was all robots. And what are we going to do with all these people who are now, as Yuval Harari has called them, useless eaters? Yeah. It, it's, a, it's, it's a rebirth of Middle Ages dark ages feudalism yeah and they're close they're shutting down farms i don't know what the numbers are I, last week i had looked up some numbers on that uh the farms are going away and you have blackrock you know they're investing in the current food system there's an art there's a paragraph in this article that's so interesting and it says blackrock also invests in healthcare, an industry that thrives on the illnesses and conditions created by eating the substandard food that the current system produces and i've been thinking that for a very very long time people the people's health I'll Right. I think a lot of uh, a lot of us are. And so last week, Newsweek's cover story was 
AI and health. And so the, it, it's going to be a lot of stuff is controlled by AI. And, you know, I've been to the doctor recently. I have a couple of conditions that are monitored. I'll be honest with you. I mean, I, I, I feel like I'm stuck in this, uh, this system that yes. maybe doesn't have my best interest. Oh, at amen to that, John. I think we all feel that way lately. Yeah. I mean, it just had a cyber attack on a lot of pharmacies in like, yeah. where you get your medication yeah. and hospitals and everything. And it's all messed up. I was talking to people at the pharmacy yeah. where I get some stuff. Yep. And they're mm -hmm. like, we don't even know if we're going to get reimbursed by the insurance companies. And there's shortages of certain antibiotics and certain things that people need. So sometimes you'll wait for a couple of weeks to get something. I mean, you can't go there after urgent care and expect to get your prescription that day anymore. Uh, we had a mess at some of the Walgreens in Wisconsin um, just last month or the month before. It was yeah, just an that's, absolute that's disaster. That's the cyber tech that I'm talking about. Uh, Wow. It, it affected uh, pharmacies, it, it, hospital and private, yeah. you know, grocery chains and, and drug stores, retail chains, wow. everywhere. Wow. Everybody is, is, and they're still reeling from the problems. Wow. Yeah. Big pharma so, plus big food. What? Yeah. That's. What could go wrong? Yeah. Right? What a recipe for disaster. John, that very, very interesting subject. There's so much more we could say on that. I want to talk to you about Israel, though, because you have a couple of articles here. Um, you know, what, what about Schumer's speech and basically I don't know, he kind of hinted at getting rid of Netanyahu or withholding aid until there's a new government there. The Gaza Ministry of Health is faking casualty numbers. Where do you want to start with this, John? I think we need to do an Israel update here. Uh, so this is what, uh, for those of us who think Israel is very, this whole Times Bible prophecy thing, it, it's interesting that it's like at the center of everything right now. <laughs> Uh, and people say, well, Israel has nothing to do with the end times. Mm -hmm. A lot of people say that. And mm -hmm. I'm like, well, okay, you know, just look at, pick up the newspaper, this little tiny country, you know, of, of nine or 10 million people that is like one four hundredth the size of all the Arab countries around it seems to be at the center of everything. And it's so interesting. So you see these people running around these protests, the pro Hamas protest and, and what was done on October 7th was just egregious. I've had many friends who've gone and they've gone down to look at the damage in these kibbutzes. And they said the, the level of brutality, uh, Simon Barrett, a friend of mine in the UK who does a Middle East report each week on TV there, he says, the level, he says, it's the biggest crime scene I've ever seen in my life. Mm. And so Israel has to respond to this. They can't let it go. And so Israel responds, and immediately everybody says, oh, Israel's committing a genocide. So first of all, there's some very good evidence. Caroline Glick did a good article, a good interview with a guy um, who's a sort of an expert on urban warfare from the U.S. He's, he's a professor at West Point. Benjamin Netanyahu, who did about a 30-minute talk with him the other day. And it appears that Hamas is cooking the numbers. So they, they come out and they don't include the military guys in Hamas, the terrorists who've been killed. They, they get put into the death statistics as, uh, as, as civilians or children. And so that you can't really rely on the numbers. But the, the basic fact of it is, look, it's war. And all these people who are totally ignorant of the international law of military uh, warfare, they said, well, it's not proportionate. You know, Hamas, first of all, they say that Israel killed most of the people on October 7th, that it was Israel responding that killed most of them. Mm -hmm. There was no rape. There was no children killed or anything like that. They were all military targets. This is the narrative in the Arab media. So Israel responds and they say, oh, well, you're committing genocide. But listen, back in 2005, Israel withdrew from Gaza. Now, look, they've controlled, they've tried to control what goes in there. When they started the war, they thought there was 180 miles of tunnels. Now it appears there are over 500 miles of these tunnels mm. underneath Gaza. Mm. It's the most sophisticated, deeply embedded terror base ever, ever uh, devised by humans in history. Hmm. So they've gone in and, but around the time that this, they took over Gaza, the population of Gaza was like a million, maybe a million too. When the war started in October, 
Israel responded to this horrific attack, the population of Gaza was 2.2 million. Well, the cry has been all along that Israel's committing genocide. So you go back to 48, there were, I don't know, under a million Arabs in Israel. Now there's, you know, between Judea, Samaria, which is improperly called the West Bank, in my opinion, and Arabs within Israel proper, there might be 4 million Arabs where there was less than a million back in 1948. In Gaza, the population of Arabs down there has doubled since 2005. And so the point is, if, if they're committing genocide, they're like the worst ones at it in human history. The claim is, well, military law requires proportional response. But that does that's not what the international military law doesn't mean that you get to kill one of the, your enemy for every one of you that they kill. The proportionate part of international military doctrine is that you're allowed to do whatever you need to eliminate the threat. And so the question is, how does Israel do this? So now our government comes along. Chuck Schumer gives this speech last week in the Senate. He clearly doing this because Biden doesn't want to do it. And, and they're trying to shore up their base. They've got a lot of mm -hmm. Muslims up in Dearborn. I was just up there to interview a, a friend of mine from Israel. Uh, he was on a book tour. And, you know, I said, do you want to go over to Dearbornistan is what we call it, because it's it's 100 percent Muslim. Yeah. And that's the Democrats need to control that, to get those votes to win Michigan in this upcoming election. So they're they're pandering to that. So here's Schumer, who claims, I'm the biggest supporter of Israel in the U.S. Senate. I'm the majority leader. And he goes, and you need to get rid of Benjamin Netanyahu. And you need, because Benjamin Netanyahu is partnered with these right-wing extremists. And so here comes the narrative, the right-wing extremist narrative. And so he's got, you know, Smotrich from this party. He's got Ben Gavir. And the, you know, it, and Israel does the people in Israel don't support this. This is nonsense. If if the elections were held today, the Netanyahu and his coalition would probably end up with more seats than they had before. Mm. So the Ben Gavir Smotrich, which is a Orthodox Jewish party, so they kind of combined in the last election. If they split up in this next election, they probably would get fourteen seats instead of ten. There was an opposition party uh, that. Danny Gantz, who's in the war cabinet. Um, somebody broke off from his party last week, Gideon Saar, and that party, if they had an election and he was in the Netanyahu coalition, Netanyahu's coalition would go from 64 out of 120 seats in the Knesset to maybe 70. And so the, the facts on the ground don't support the narrative that Biden, Schumer, Blinken, Jake Sullivan, all these uh, in Am uh, Amos Hochstein running around trying to get Israel to back off. The other problem, Mary, is that Israel is facing two, well, several potential fronts. The situation with Egypt is kind of deteriorating. And by the way, go look at the pictures. Israel has the most sophisticated border security of any place in the world <laughs> on their border. Mm -hmm. uh, if you, so that's a problem. Jordan is a problem, but the big problem is Hezbollah and Lebanon. So in Southern Lebanon, because Israel and Hezbollah are kind of fighting back and forth, Israel's killed almost as many Hezbollah fighters now since October 7th in, in a non-declared war, just sort of an operation that they killed in the in the uh, 2006 Second Lebanon War. Mm. So oh. the question becomes, you know, how do they deal with this? And whatever they found in Gaza in terms of tunnels, they think the problem is much worse in southern Lebanon. And mm. these tunnels have been drilled through bedrock. So in you know, has, uh, uh, Hamas in Gaza had 20,000 rockets and missiles. Hezbollah has somewhere between 150,000 and 250,000 rockets and missiles, some of which can reach very precise targets through the whole of Israel, including their, their 
nuclear power plant down at Demona and Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, and everything is within range of these rockets. Oh. And they have the, and so there's, so 120,000 people in Southern Lebanon have left Southern Lebanon because of the Israel attacks. They've destroyed a lot of villages and Hezbollah targets. And the people there that follow this, Alma Research and others, they say that every third, at least every third home, if not every other home, business school is directly tied to Hezbollah. So the only way for Israel to deal with this, to get it done, is to make southern Lebanon look like Gaza. So you got 120,000 Lebanese who've left, and they're upset with Hezbollah, but you have 80,000 Israelis who've left the cities along the Lebanon border, cities and towns along the Lebanon border, and they've had to go down, and they're living in hotels now for five or six months in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem and elsewhere, and it's it you know it's having an economic impact, and and they're saying we can't go back until Hezbollah is dealt with. So, mm-hmm. I'm just saying is if the whatever happened in Gaza will have to happen on a much larger scale in Lebanon if Israel is going to deal with the problem. Mm-hmm. But then at the same time that that's happening, there's a tremendous amount of support. Most surveys indicate 75 or 80 percent of the people that live in the West Bank, which is biblical Judea and biblical Samaria. It's the biblical heartland of the Bible. And I have Jewish friends who've lived in Israel all their lives. They cannot go there. So I go to a place like Shechem, you know, when I'm there. I go to Samaria. I go to Jericho. They can't go there by law. Israeli Jews living in the Bible land of the Bible cannot go to large portions of the of that place because of the threat. And 75 to 80 percent of the Arabs in those areas, by the way, they complain that Jews want to live in that area at the settlements. Our government is sanctioning settlements. We're opposing it. I, I'm just saying that um, Israel you, you know, the, the biblical admonition, Bill Koenig and others have talked about, that I will bless them that bless you and mm-hmm. curse them that curse you. Mm-hmm. We're we're playing with fire in our government. Oh, yeah. And so when Schumer made that speech oh, last yeah. week, mm-hmm. I wasn't like, what's going to happen? And boom, we have a bunch of tornadoes in my <laughs> neck of the woods. And this happens yeah. all the time, Mary. You know it happens. Yeah. It could be a hurricane. It could be a tornado. You know. Well, the only thing I haven't seen yet is earthquakes, yeah. but I, I just think that uh, let Israel do what they think they need to do. Absolutely. And Joe Biden yep. and Chuck Schumer and yep. Rajita Tlaib and uh, okay. AOC need to just keep their trap shut. Wow. Yeah, John, what a great hour of information. And, and the tone deaf West still wants that uh, Palestinian state, that terror state, that te- technocratic state. We are out of time. We only have... Uh, 20 seconds left, so I want to take the time to thank you so much for all the research Thanks, that you Mary. do and, and all the and it's, you're so thorough and in presenting these things, and, and I know that it's such a blessing to the body, and we're going to be praying for you and praying for the people that suffered loss in that severe weather, and we need to do this again sometime this spring, uh, but thank you, John. Sure. Appreciate you so much. Thank you, Mary. God bless you. All right. The end of another podcast. A lot of great information. Um, and it'll be posted shortly at StandUpForTheTruth.com. Also at StandUpForTheTruth.com, you can get gear. You can get shirts and hats and mugs for Stand Up For The Truth. So if you go to StandUpForTheTruth.com and click the gear, go to the menu and find gear. That'll direct you to RedPillPrints.com, and you can get all those great shirts and hats and mugs, et cetera, et cetera. We appreciate all of our listeners. We are listener-supported, and we very much appreciate the support that we get. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever. Amen.